Hello everyone, I'm Judge Jennifer Bruner of the 10th District Court of Appeals in Franklin County, Ohio. I'm running for the Supreme Court of Ohio to be an Associate Justice on that court. And as part of my campaign, I'm having a great time interviewing judges and judicial candidates from around the state. And the role, uh, part of the role of judges is to educate the public about the judiciary. So this is one way that both my guest, Judge Chris Brown of the Franklin County Common Pleas Court, and I can do that. Um, Chris is, was elected in 2014, ran the same year that I ran uh, for the Court of Appeals the first time, and now he's up for his first re-election. Welcome, Chris, and I'm um, so glad to have you here today. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. So, um, so Judge, I, I, I just would like for people who are tuning into this or, you know, pick this up to watch it, to know um, how is it being a common police court judge in Franklin County? Uh, what made you run for judge? What's your background and um, why do you want to keep going? Um, yeah, so um, I grew up in Columbus. Uh, I grew up on the south side. I went to Columbus South High School uh, before I went to Ohio State for undergraduate and then capital law. Um, I always kind of knew I wanted to get into the legal uh, profession based on my experiences growing up. Um, south High was very uh, racially diverse uh, school. Um, you know, I had a lot of friends who uh, were African American and, you know, I'd see kind of, you know, different hardships and struggles that they went through, which I was, you know, being, you know, uh, a white kid on the South side, you know, they, they went through different experiences than I did. Um, but I saw, you know, how, you know, sometimes poverty uh, impacted their life and, uh, you know, having parents with, you know, drug and alcohol issues, um, impacted their life and impacted, I played basketball and, uh, you know, some of the kids I played basketball with, you know, you could see it, you know, affected just how they played basketball. It affected their game. Um, you know, the, these problems going on at home and, you know, I'd see, you know, I'd hear stories about, you know, um, run-ins with, uh, you know, law enforcement being stopped, you know, just walking home from school. And, uh, it always kind of, you know, I, I thought, um, having a, a law degree, uh, would be a way to kind of, uh, you know, stand up for my neighborhood and the people I went to school with. And, and um, it was the best avenue to kind of right some of the wrongs that, that I kind of saw around me growing up. Um, uh, I've been on the bench since 2014. Uh, before that, I was an assistant prosecutor for six years. I was a criminal defense attorney for three years. So I represented kind of people on both sides of the criminal um, uh, the criminal bar. Um, having that experience, I thought, made me an ideal candidate for a judge because I, I've, I've been in the state's shoes. I've been in the defense uh, counsel's shoes. Um, I, I love it. I've got the best job in the world. Um, I always enjoyed doing trial work as an attorney, and I still kind of get to do that now as a judge. I'm, although I'm not the uh, advocate, I, I still enjoy, you know, a good uh, presentation, and I like to kind of second guess, well, why'd they, why'd they put on this witness or why'd they, you know, why, why didn't they talk about this, you know, fact? Um, it's just, it's fun for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy the work that I'm doing on the bench. Uh, I think I'm making a positive impact in our community and I want to keep doing that. Um, that's, hopefully I get another six years to do it. That's fantastic. Um, I, I think people might not realize that um, uh, a judge gets a docket and that's sort of a group of cases. And I always keep a special place in my heart for you because um, you have the docket that I had um, <laughs> 20 years ago. There, was, there were two judges in between us, but um, it, it, it's, um, and it's not the exact same cases, but um, it's still basically the courtroom I would be in if I were still there. So I kind of, I always keep you a special place in my heart for, for you. I, um, I still get some of your post-conviction stuff every once in a while. <laughs> oh, you probably do. <laughs> uh, you know, I, um, I, 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 I've been in your courtroom. I've actually watched you in action. I had a judge who came from the Republic of Georgia in the former Soviet Union who wanted to watch a docket and you were gracious enough um, for us to, to sit in the courtroom and watch some proceedings. And I was impressed with your demeanor and your, um, I want to say command of the courtroom. What I mean by that is that you were able to, to, to really um, manage everything going on in your courtroom at the same time. I mean, you have 
victims' families, you have defendants' families, you've got deputies, you've got probation officers, you've got prosecutors, defense attorneys, and other people sitting in the audience. And um, you know, what what do you think is is makes for the right temperament for a judge? Um, you have to have um, that ability to listen and to kind of listen actively. Um, not just sit there like a lump, you know, you've got to be engaged in, in what's going on. And so um, when I'm up there, I'm kind of, I know what's going on, you know, over at defense counsel table. I know what's going on over at the prosecutor side. If, if there's someone getting unruly in the back or, you know, making some noises, I've, you know, got my eye on that. And, um, and, and it's about communicating with my staff and uh, with the people in the courtroom. Um, I think you came on a day when I was doing sentencing hearings and those are always pretty hectic. Um, but I put a lot of work into those beforehand so that when we actually get on the bench, I know, you know, what I think I want to do. I know who I need to talk to. Um, in terms of just the temperament, uh, you know, you have to be a, a, an active listener and be engaged, but you do have to, you know, be willing to make a decision. You, you, we don't have a, we're not like you on the Court of Appeals. We don't have a ton of time to ponder everything that, that's uh, in front of us. So you have to be willing to kind of trust your instincts and know what the right decision is and, you know, stand behind it. Even if, you know, uh, later it turns out to be the wrong one, you, you have to, you know, without being, you know, a, a jerk, <laughs> um, you know, uh, you have to be able to say, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. And, and that's my ruling. And then, uh, go from there. So, I, I mean, um, you know, I try to treat everyone with respect uh, is the main thing. People come into court, they don't want to be there, most of them, um, and try to make it as pleasant an, an experience as possible um, so that when they leave, even if they lose a case, um, you see this sometimes with pro se filers, you know, they just want their day in court. Um, and if you give them that and you make them feel like they've had the chance to be heard, um, I think they leave with, uh, even if they lose, they, they leave with a, a greater appreciation uh, for, for what the system's about. So um, a pro se filer is someone who represents themselves, correct? Yep. J just in case some people didn't know sure. the Latin term. <laughs> um, I still remember race ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself, you know, from law school. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, the, when you're sentencing somebody, um, when you're done for the day, is it hard to just let it go? Um, yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, there are some cases where, you know, I, 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 you always second guess yourself. And I'm sure you probably did this when you were uh, on the trial bench. You, you know, did, was I too hard on this person? Was I, was I too lenient? Did I, was I too, you know, did I, did I let, you know, sympathy get in the way? And, and, and did, I, did I follow the law? Did I do what I was supposed to do? Did I apply the sentencing factors correctly? Did I weigh them? Did I give enough consideration to, to this factor? Or did I not give enough? You know, it's, um, you know, you take that home with you sometimes. And uh, I, I try to, you know, just remind myself, you know, that, you know, I, I think part of the preparation that goes into those sentencings does help you know that you've made the right decision. Um, you know, if I've prepared well enough and I make my ruling, I, I can feel comfortable knowing that, hey, I looked at it from every angle and, and I feel comfortable doing it. Sure. So can you explain to people what a pre-sentence investigation is and how that works? Uh, it's a report done by a probation officer um, about the individual's background. It looks at, you know, the facts of their specific case. Um, their medical history, their family history, any history of drug or alcohol abuse, mental health issues, looks at their peer associations, if they're associated with other people who have uh, contact with the courts, it, it looks at their family history. I mean, it goes through, it's a pretty detailed interview. It's usually about two hours it takes to just to interview uh, the person. And, and it, so they compile um, a giant, it could be 20, 30 page report uh, that we use to then apply that information contained therein to the sentencing factors that we have to apply. Um, and so, and, so when a judge orders a pre-sentence investigation, for instance, at a plea or at the end of a trial, um, there is some, I think, comfort for everyone involved, including the public, that the judge really has taken into account a lot of different factors and that it's specific toward that person, correct? 
Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's, it's very valuable for other stakeholders, um, like probation officers, if, if they go to prison and they're released on parole, the parole officer can utilize that. It's, very, it's a very valuable piece of information that we have. And so we rely on that a lot. So uh, you you came into this with um, a primarily criminal law background, but about half of your docket, maybe a little more, is is civil. Although it seems like criminal, you spend so much more time on because of speedy trial rights. Um, mm -hmm. So how has it been um, jumping into the civil world while still uh, and look while you're you're still doing so much criminal as well? Um, I, I think I've made a pretty good adjustment. Um, it, it's there are definitely times where. Um, we'll be at a hearing either, you know, in a discovery dispute or, a, you know, a Daubert hearing and something will come up and I, and I have to just take five minutes and <laughs> go into chambers and take a recess and, and look it up and, and try to, you know, get a better grasp of um, what, what's going on and what the principles are that we're talking about. Um, but in trials, um, I did a lot of uh, civil trials my first couple of years on the bench because I think a lot of the attorneys around town didn't know me. And I think there was a lot of that uncertainty created, uh, um, uh, you know, a, um, a desire to kind of feel me out a little bit maybe. And, you know, at the end of the day, the rules of evidence are the same almost across the board, whether it's criminal or civil. Um, and so I think having that criminal trial experience being in court every day for 10 years before taking the bench, I think really helped me to, to make rulings, uh, you know, in midstream as, you know, as an issue comes up, whether it's civil or criminal, uh, I think I've been able to adapt uh, well with that. You know, some of the more substantive law I've really um, tried to work hard at. Uh, I do a lot of my own writing on civil decisions, motions for summary judgment and things like that. And that's been a real good way to help me get, you know, that, that substantive law uh, kind of ingrained in me. Um, and so I, I've, I've made that a point uh, in my time on the bench to, to really tackle that so that I do have that, that um, underlying uh, depth of knowledge that, that you need. That's, that's fantastic. I, I, not a lot of judges will do that much um, decision writing just based on time. Um, I, I know when I went to the bench, I thought, oh, I'm going to write this and this and this decision. And there were just so many crises that came in that um, I had to rely on a staff attorney to at least give me a draft. Um, so, so you have, you're in Franklin County where there are 17 judges as compared to Cuyahoga County, and this is just general division, where they have 34 judges. Um, I know Franklin has more magistrates, but, um, and you do that with, with how much staff? Um, I have one staff attorney and then I share a magistrate with uh, Judge uh, Sarah, who's my chambermate. So we share Mike Thompson as our magistrate. And so he does and, work with both me and uh, Judge Sarah. And then I think you end up sharing a, a legal assistant or a secretary with another judge as well. Is that yeah. still that way? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think people would be and, and uh, like an average docket is how many hundreds of cases? Um, we average about 600. Um, between all the judges, we, we end up about 600 uh, each. per each. Um, it's usually about two thirds civil, one third criminal. But like you said, the criminal does occupy more of your time because people are being held without, or they're, they're not able to post bail. And so, you know, you're talking about a deprivation of liberty. Um, that does, I, I'd say the criminal docket occupies probably 75% of my active work day. Um, even though it only comprises one third of my caseload. No, no. Yeah, and I, 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 rem I remember well. I remember well. <laughs> so, it, in addition to the court, I mean, what are what are some of the other things that you do, community wise, family wise, that that help make you a whole person? Um, I am very involved. Um, I've ridden Pelotonia since 2016. Uh, mostly I do the 50 mile ride, but I did the 100 mile ride back in uh, 2017, which I was pretty proud of the, about that. Although we can't do it this year for obvious Unfortunately. reasons. Unfortunately, yeah, uh, I saw it was canceled. In terms of community stuff, uh, I like to go out to uh, the schools around town. Um, I have a pretty working relation, a good working relationship with uh, a teacher at Worthington Kilbourne. 
she brings her class down. She teaches like an intro to law class. So she'll bring her class down um, twice a year. And then I'll go up to her class and speak to them after they come down twice a year. And that's always fun. I've spoken at you know, uh, Reynoldsburg uh, High School has a, uh, a government and politics class and, and they invite guest speakers. I, I try to get out as much as I can uh, to the schools to kind of educate kids on, you know, the judicial branch is one of the, probably the, the least understood branch uh, of government. And so trying to just create awareness uh, of what, what judges do, what our function is, what kind of cases we handle, uh, I think is really important so that there's an appreciation for, you know, the fact that we are a third uh, uh, co-equal, co-extensive branch of government. Yeah, so um, ab absolutely, yes. So I, I think back to your coming from South High School. Uh, I mean, I grew up in Columbus and I grew up in the North End and um, I spent a lot of time as I was going through my career, um, even, even during college, I worked for the summer lunch program, which was a United States Department of Agriculture um, summer program to continue the free school lunch program. So a lot of times we were on Ann Street at the pool that was there. But um, you must have had some mentors that helped you uh, really kind of see the future and believe what you could do because you've done an amazing amount of things for somebody, for anybody coming from anywhere your age. Um, who were who those kinds of people? Um, my teachers at South would be um, Jim Rogers. He was my band teacher, but he was also a uh, tennis and golf coach. Um, he was, you know, very um, supportive of me. I played band uh, in high school and uh, he, he believed in me and, you know, he would prod me to, to try new things. He got me to play. He taught me how to play stand up bass. Um, which I, you know, I, um, he, he was just always the kind of person who would, who would nudge you. He didn't push you, but he nudged you to try something new. Um, Ms. Davidson uh, and Mr. Corbin, they were both um, government AP teachers. Um, they, they were very uh, supportive, um, even though I, I think they saw that I had an interest in government and in and, and politics, not necessarily even politics, but but just have, you know, social studies, uh, civics. Um, and so they were very uh, helpful um, in kind of prodding me along um, to kind of pursue that and open those doors up for me. And, and I've met your dad in some of the parades. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure there was some, some help at home too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my mom, uh, uh, my mom was a teacher, so she was always very, um, very supportive and my dad too you know he uh just you know my dad went back to uh back to college when he when we were kids uh to get a teaching degree and so you know having an education um w was always important to him uh and and for us to have one uh was extremely important and so uh, you know he did anything uh i needed to you know he'd work night shifts um, so that he could support himself and support our family while he was going to school um, to, to kind of, you know, I, I always took that work ethic from him um, that, you know, education is, is so extremely valuable and, and important. And, I, uh, you know, he, he kind of taught by example. And so you've got a wife and two kids now. Yep. Yep. And, um, okay, trivia <laughs> question. You, 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 okay, so you played the bass and you played basketball. How tall are you? Six five. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm starting to I'm starting to shrink a little. I'm now like six four and a six four and a half. So I, <laughs> it's all right. Just stand up straighter. You'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so um you know before we go um I just want to give you the chance to say to if if someone were to say um, Judge Brown, why should I vote for you? What would you say? I'd say my uh, experience, um, both as a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and now five years as a judge, you know, I have a unique perspective and a unique insight um, that, that I can bring to the bench, uh, especially when you think about my background and where I grew up and where I came from. You know, you're not just a case in my courtroom, you're a person, you're, you're, you have an interest in, in the outcome of your case. And I want to, you know, I understand that and I want to make sure that you feel that uh, the law uh, is working for you, even if you don't win your case, that, that, uh, that 
the law is, is um, a reliable, trusted uh, system that you can turn to when you do need uh, to, to resort to that. And that you're going to have a judge who is going to be a good listener, who's going to you know, think thoughtfully about your case and make the correct decision under the law. Um, I, I think that having all those background uh, experiences uh, growing up, I think makes me the best person to, to fulfill that job. And uh, I, I hope I get to keep doing it for the next six years. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to see how well this has turned out for you since you were first elected in 2014. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for Franklin County that um, they've had you as their public servant. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. I wish you the very best in the election. And this has been Achieving Justice with Judge Chris Brown from the Franklin County Common Pleas Court General Division, the guy who has my old docket from 20 years ago, who I know is doing very well with it. So thanks again for coming today and um, hope to see you in person sometime soon. I hope so too. Thank you for having me, Judge. Thank you, Judge.